Hello again, it's me, Spencer Huss, and we're resuming our discussion of Native, the PMC, and therapeutic culture. And this week we're taking a deeper look at T.J. Jackson Lears's No Place of Grace. And this will be the penultimate talk. Next week we'll be circling back around to Native and drawing some final conclusions, sewing everything up, and then it'll be back to Lori's regularly scheduled programming. Uh, so the topic of this talk is neurasthemia as metaphor, but also T.J. Jackson Lear's on evasive banality. Uh, the subject matter is a book he wrote in 1981 called No Place of Grace. Uh, before we get deeper into that, I wanted to review the concept of the, the therapeutic ethos uh, by the terms he laid out in the book. He writes that from the therapeutic view... Well-being is no longer a matter of morality, but of physical and psychic health. And health is often defined in terms of spurious normality, smooth adjustment, ceaseless growth, and peace of mind. The insoluble conflicts in psyche and society fall away. Whether it assumes psychic scarcity or psychic abundance, the therapeutic worldview is both a symptom and a source of the continuing evasive banality in modern culture. And we'll circle back around to that evasive banality. He goes on. Ever since the early 20th century, the therapeutic orientation has been promoted by social engineers and apologists for welfare capitalism. They have devalued public life not only by insulating government from the electorate, but also by reducing political issues to psychological issues. They have sought to create a civilization in which, as the young Walter Lippmann wrote, quote, politics would be like education an effort to develop, train, and nurture men's impulses, unquote. Retailoring the revolt against pos positivism to corporate institutional life, the theorists of manipulative liberalism have urged the freeing of instinctual impulses in order to channel them into quote-unquote constructive purposes. The leaders of the burgeoning advertising industry have had similar ends in view. Recognizing the cash value of a therapeutic sensibility, they have manipulated needs and underwritten a notion of self-fulfillment through voracious acquisition. Yearnings for authenticity have been well suited to the class interests of managerial and professional elites. Um, and so this book, uh, which is subtitled Anti-Modernism and the Transformation of American Culture, 1880-1920, to is a look at how the therapeutic culture wasn't just an outgrowth of 1960s new left counterculture, but has its roots even further back in American history. Um, and as an attempt to deal with, well, what happens when uh, the, the privileged elite in modern American society are dissatisfied? Uh, and this book is an exploration of various sort of seemingly anti-modern movements and currents that they got involved with um, and ultimately that were recuperated back into modernity through a therapeutic ethos and, and we'll talk more about that going forward and he writes that while I was discovering the ambivalence of anti-modernism by which he means uh, most of the privileged elite that fell into anti-modern ways of thinking whether it was orientalism or cults of vitality or youth deep down they still believed in basic modern assumptions of the free individual and a capitalist society that they were pretty high up on the ladder of so that's what he means by the ambivalences uh the people that were rebelling against modernity were very much creatures of it so while I was discovering the ambivalence of anti-modernism, I was also reading social and demographic history, which demonstrated what I had long suspected, that old stock northeastern elites had kept an extraordinary tenacious hold on wealth and power since the Civil War. Contrary to conventional historical wisdom, the period 1880 to 1920 was not marked by democratization and elite decline, but rather by the reinforcement of elite power in new corporate and bureaucratic forms. Uh, he says, the desperate desire to flee Victorian decorum and experience quote-unquote real life in all its intens intensity 
was potentially subversive, but it arose in a culture where loyalties beyond the self were becoming diffuse and problematic. A cult of experience that was merely self-referential provided little basis for forming alternative values. Instead, it became assimilated, largely if not entirely. And he's always pointing in the book this largely but not entirely to a new idiom of domination. The new idiom was therapeutic rather than religious. It promised self-fulfillment through intense experience rather than salvation through self-denial. It expressed a new version of possessive individualism for a new corporate society. And by helping to legitimate the power of emergent managerial elites, the new idiom helped ensure that wealth, power, and expertise would remain in the hands of a few. Uh, so he talks about, he never uses this term, but basically he's talking about the Janus-faced or, or double-sided aspects of attempts to evade modernity. Uh, so on the one, you had the mainstream uh, official justifications for American society as it entered into the what's sometimes called the second industrial revolution after the uh, federal centralization that occurred after the Civil War and the further redevelopment of the country from there. Uh, so he writes that Americans managed to avoid the brutal implications of classical liberalism by embedding it in a framework of optimistic moralism. Embracing the basic principles set forth by Smith, that's Adam Smith, they rejected the more pessimistic dimensions of classical theory developed by David Ricardo, who, who held that wages in the long run would never rise above subsistence level, and Thomas Malthus, who held that population would always tend to outstrip food supply. Both Ricardo and Malthus recalled the Hobbesian vision of conflict. Americans preferred the sunnier views of Frederick Bastiat, a French economist. Da, 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 da. He goes on a little bit farther. Here's the relevant point. Americans could not take their economics undiluted by moralism. To justify an ethos of autonomous achievement to sustain moral authority in a fragmented market society, they had to banish the Hobbesian specter of amoral struggle. Uh, so, so one form of the banal evasion he's talking about is to invent official just-so stories about, yeah, it seems like the market is uh, transforming American society, degrading nature, creating a wretched underclass. Uh, it seems like that, but this is all part of progress to a glorious, harmonious future where everything's going to work itself out. So don't worry about what you see right in front of your eyes and read in the papers, because the point is the trajectory. The point isn't where we are and what we're doing. It's where we're going. But some people, uh, usually the more sensitive and introspective among them, uh, as well as the the less credulous, uh, didn't find these arguments as persuasive. So then enters another kind of evasion. Is the problem, is the, the answer to this to truly create a socialist alternative to capitalist domination? Um, or is it to get lost in various forms of uh, avant-garde art or religious pietism? And for a lot of these people, the answer is, yeah, uh, I'm not going to give up my privilege and create an alternative revolutionary society. That seems complicated for like a thousand reasons. Uh, but maybe if I uh, study uh, esoteric Buddhism, maybe this is a good way to go. Uh, so kind of on this note, he writes that it is important to be clear on this point. The word evasion might suggest a conscious process deliberately planned by bourgeois moralists and literati to further the interests of their class. Nothing could be more mistaken. In fact, the process of evasion was half-conscious, a matter of instinctive self-deception rather than deliberate duplicity. Its social consequences were unintended, yet profound. By underwriting the equation of material and moral progress, the pattern of evasion strengthened the cultural hegemony of dominant social groups throughout the 19th century. Throughout the book, he characterizes various notable historical figures, 
and how they would basically try and evade the socioeconomic origins that they came from by devoting themselves to various, what I would call cults in the positive sense, but cults of art and aesthetics or of domesticity and femininity or of militarism. Uh, there was lots of talking about the will and the youth and the unconscious and how vital experience, maybe we can't know anything ever, but we can at least feel through having powerful experiences that this must be true. Some people dabbled in medieval Catholic devotions, some of them Orientalism. Uh, primitivism was a big thing, let's get back to rugged nature. Um, or in the case of the rustic naturalism I've listed, let's just get back to a sort of bucolic agrarian environment and lifestyle. And the entire thrust of the whole book is really about how these different anti-modern streams and the people that participated in them ultimately helped transform and make for a more resilient modern America going into the interwar period. And throughout it all you have the early stages of therapeutic culture weaving its way into every sphere of American life. Writes, both older and newer styles of therapy have persisted throughout the 20th century. As formalized regimens, and more importantly as the most self-conscious manifestations of cultural tendency, a therapeutic worldview which has become part of the continuing pattern of evasive banality in modern culture. Celebrating spurious harmony, the therapeutic outlook has further undermined personal moral responsibility and promoted an ethic of self-fulfillment well attuned to the consumer ethos of 20th century capitalism. And it has provoked such perceptive critics as Reef and Christopher Lash. But neither Reef nor Lash have, has quite grasped the full historical complexity of the therapeutic worldview. Both tend to tie it too closely to psychoanalysis and other formal therapeutic regimens. Both sometimes treated almost entirely as a product of the post-World World War II era. Actually, the therapeutic worldview was less a formal regime than a way of life embraced by people sometimes only dimly aware of psychology. Sorry, of psychiatry. And its roots stretched not merely into the counterculture of the 1960s and the suburban affluence of post-war America, but into the cultural turmoil of the late 19th century. Above all, the effort to reconstruct a coherent sense of identity in a culture which was rendering all identities and all values vaporous and unreal. Further, the therapeutic worldview was not simply imposed on a hapless working class by the quote-unquote helping professions, as Lash sometimes suggests. It was also the product of an unconscious collaboration between professionals and their clients among the bourgeoisie. The professional self-interest of therapists and social engineers meshed with the unfulfilled longings of middle and upper class Americans, longings which were shaped and sustained by the late 19th century crisis of cultural authority. And we're going to come back to that because it's a central idea, the crisis of cultural authority as America was being revolutionized after the Second Civil War. There was a question of what was real, what was to be believed, what was to be done. Uh, he goes on, and uh, I quote this so at length because it, it's all so good, and it's better that you hear from him than me, I think. The therapeutic worldview, in other words, has a long history. Goethe had foreseen it as early as 1782 when he wrote, quote, Speaking for myself, I do believe humanity will win in the long run. I am only afraid that at the same time the world will have turned into one huge hospital where everyone is everyone else's humane nurse." Unquote. A century later, the American bourgeoisie had begun to establish that huge hospital. By 1899, Scribner's complained that life no longer seemed a battlefield, but rather a kind of infirmary where moral invertebrates sought emotional security by avoiding responsibility for their actions. And the most conspicuous moral in invertebrate was the neurasthenic. Indeed, the neurasthenic embodied Reef's therapeutic mode in embryo. Paralyzed by introspection and self-doubt, obsessed with easing his own psychic tensions. 
As larger frameworks of meaning weakened, introspection focused on the self alone and became morbid. Among earlier Protestants, for whom salvation was a definite goal, self-scrutiny had sometimes produced intense feelings of guilt. Among their uncertain descendants, for whom salvation had become unreal, self-scrutiny more often engendered a diffuse anxiety. Plagued by doubt but still driven by a Protestant conscience, introspective late Victorians felt compelled to seek relief from decision-making and responsibility. One woman habitually took six-hour train rides because, quote, is such a comfort not to have the fireman come in to ask whether he shall put any more coal in the fire. And the engineer pulls his throttle without looking to see if I signal him. And even if the train runs off the track, it is none of my business, and nobody will think of blaming me for it, unquote. That, of course, was an idiosyncratic fl flight from anxiety. More often, the escape route led not to the railroad station, but to bed with nervous prostration, the so-called disease of the age. The earliest full-length description of nervous prostration was, prostration was George Miller Beard's American Nervousness, published in 1880, hence where he pulls from for the title of the book. Beard, a New York neurologist, had earlier coined the, coined the term neurasthenia to describe what he felt was a new nervous malady, characterized by quote-unquote lack of nerve force rather than excitability. Besides a bewildering variety of physical signs, including dyspepsia, insomnia, nocturnal emissions, and tooth decay, Beard listed such mental symptoms as desire for stimulants and narcotics, fear of responsibility, of open places or closed places, fear of society, fear of being alone, fear of fears, fear of contamination, fear of everything, deficient mental control, lack of decision in trifling matters, hopelessness. Beard's lumping together of disparate phenomena suggested that neurasthenia was a catch-all term, encompassing what present-day psychiatrists would classify as various neurotic symptoms. They were unified, however, by a common effect, a paralysis of the will. Tortured by indecision and, and doubt, the neurasthenic seemed a pathetic descendant of the iron-willed Americans who had cleared forests, drained swamps, and subdued a continent. In fact, Beard claimed, neurasthenia was virtually unknown among his grandparents' generation. The, pro the disease was a product of the post-Civil War era. And this is another form of evasion. I think he's implicitly arguing. I don't think he lays this out anywhere. But, okay, so some people can evade by saying, yeah, I'm part of the dominant culture, but it's all good because we're trending towards inevitable progress. Other people can tap out and say, yeah, well, that's lame, but I can join the arts and crafts movement. Um, or I can write uh, exciting poetry about how empowering and thrilling it was to uh, see firsthand the war with Cuba. Um, or, yeah, I can retreat into a Buddhist monastery and uh, find the true peace. Another way out is just to say, oh, I can't even. Ben totally just texted me right now, and I- Yeah? I can't even. Can't even what? Even. Like, I, I just can't even. Oh, like you literally can't even. Yeah. Okay. And uh, lay on your bed and rest as you ride around. But one of the things I like so much about No Place for Grace is because he has an explicit, explicitly Marxian perspective, he also says these aren't just people freaking out because if it was just people freaking out, if this was part of an eternal human condition, then why wasn't this not only not common but basically unheard of before the Civil War? And his argument is, well, there were changes in the nature of the economy and political social world after the second after the Civil War that produced creatures suffering from these symptoms. He says, Yet it is easy to overemphasize the role of elites in spreading a therapeutic worldview. Uh, and, and the therapeutic worldview is what's coming about to justify all of this, that, uh, hey, you're the corporate executive, and isn't it all great, and you should feel good, and you sh you're realizing yourself through this. Um, or 
if you retreat into one of those romantic cults, well, this too is good therapy. Um, and if you're a neurasthenic, well, this too, you know, oh, it's not your fault. Because we all can't get over ourselves enough to say, well, maybe we need to create a more sane and rational social order. Okay, but back to the text. Yet it is easy to overemphasize the role of elites in spreading a therapeutic worldview. One must remember that 20th century cultural development has created a congenial atmosphere for therapeutic conceptions of reality. Since the pre-World War I era, the sense of unreality has gradually enveloped nearly all of American society. The growing requirements of a consumer-oriented economy have accelerated the market's ceaseless cycle of creation and destruction. Under capitalism, quote, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profaned, unquote, Marx wrote. At the time, at the same time, industrialization per se has played a major role in spreading the sense of unreality. Agrarian patterns of living have virtually disappeared. Americans have exchanged the drudgery of the farm for the boredom of the factory and the bureaucracy. More dependent than ever on impersonal decisions made in distant cities, more insulated than ever from primary processes of life and death, many contemporary Americans, like their turn-of-the-century predecessors, feel vaguely impotent, cut off from so-called real life. The sense of unreality afflicts the self as well as the external world. It reinforces the feeling of ego disintegration common to many normal Americans, as well as psychiatric patients and it has been immeasurably strengthened by the continued softening of mainstream Christianity. The platitudinous creed of Henry Ward Beecher and Lyman Abbott have spread throughout much of American society. Accommodating itself to a secularizing culture, liberal Christianity has forgotten the stratum of hardness in the Christian tradition, evaded the tragic contradictions at the heart of life, and lost much of its ability to impart a sense of gravity and larger meaning to the human condition. It may be that the current reawakening of evangelicalism is now providing a genuine source of resistance to the secularizing drift. Certainly, I do not presume to understand such a vast phenomenon, but I confess I am skeptical of any religious movement which offers conversion as a cure for anxiety and which promises that Christianity will somehow make life easier. My sense is that much, though not all, of the resurgent evangelicalism has joined liberal Christianity in surrendering to therapeutic ideals. You're good. So this is a short distillation of the argument of this book, and I would really encourage you to read it. It's it's a really good one. Um, and to conclude, I want to circle back around to that Goethe quote because I think it is so uh, poignant at the level of imagery. Because this quote from him, I do believe humanity will win in the long run. I am only afraid that at the same time, the world will have turned into one huge hospital where everyone is everyone else's humane nurse. And that rings with uh, one of the early thoughts in The Triumph of the Th Therapeutic by Philip Reef, where he writes that in this emergent culture, and he's talking therapeutic culture, a wider range of people will have spiritual concerns and engage in spiritual pursuits. There will be more singing and more listening. People will continue to genuflect and read the Bible, which has long achieved the status of great literature. But no prophet will denounce the rich attire or stop the dancing. There will be more theater, not less, and no Puritan will denounce the stage and draw its curtains. On the contrary, I expect that modern society will mount psychodramas far more frequently than its ancestors mounted miracle plays, with patient analysts acting out their inner lives, after which they could extemporize the final act as interpretation. Culturist therapy becomes realizable in part because of the increasing automa automat automaticity that's not an easy word to automatically say of the productive system. But without the discipline of work, a vast re-ritualization of social life will probably occur to contain aggression in a steady state and maintain necessary levels of attention to activity. The end or goal is to keep going. Americans, as F. Scott Fitzgerald concluded, believe in the green light. I am aware that these speculations may be thought to contain some parodies of an apocalypse, but what apocalypse has ever been so kindly? 
What culture has ever attempted to see to it that no, no ego is hurt? Perhaps the elimination of the tragic sense, which is tantamount to the elimination of irreconcilable moral principles, is no tragedy. Civilization could be, for the first time in history, the expression of human content rather than the consolato consolatory control of discontents. Then and only then would the religious question receive a markedly different answer from those dominant until recently in our cultural history. So anyway, to conclude, we're almost done with this series, and we've all been building up for my final critique of Native and Caitlin B. Curtis and the social spheres that she represents, basically as a woke PMC therapeutic, therapeuticized subject, and why ultimately this is a very conservative way of looking at the world. So anyway, thanks for listening. I'll see you next week.